Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Number one, number one, isn't this a lot of fun? Um, I've taken my mask off, though, that anybody who needs to lip read can do so. Um, I want to thank everyone for, for joining us in yet another Author Talk series. And um, it's a great evening. I think that we can applaud that. And, um, you know, spring appears to be on the way. I think Punxsutawney Phil was wrong this year. Uh, I'm Eric Rao, I'm Director of Library Services here at Hagley, uh, where we preserve and share the story of American enterprise, the unfolding history of American business, technology, and industrial design, and its impact on our world. Uh, our collections cover the entire range of American commerce, uh, enterprise, record on paper, film, tape, digital files, any format you can imagine. And our mission encompasses not just collecting that stuff, but sharing it all with um, scholars, but then also with you all. And um, you know, events, in events like this one that you're about to experience. So um, this installment of our author talk series, like most, is the product of the Center for the History of, Te of Business Technology and Society, which translates to Roger Horowitz, its director, right over here. Uh, Carol Lockman, who is in the back. Oh, up, up, uh, up top. Ben Spahn and Greg Hargreaves, programming officer. And um, I'd like to first thank them for uh, putting this together tonight. We're also grateful for other staff members in the library and also for colleagues in facilities management here at Hagley um, and friends from Showworks and so forth that make, who often labor in obscure, obscurity, but without which we just wouldn't be able to do this at all. So, um, we're very especially grateful, however, to you for making it out on this evening. And um, we're hoping that we'll see more of you in other events that we have throughout the year. So we want to make sure, if you want to make sure that you hear more about those events, consider becoming a member. Um, I think there's some information on the back table in the silo for you to take a look at. Um, and you can also you know, follow us on Facebook, Twitter, etc. Um, please also let us know what you um, think about tonight's event. You'll have noticed that there's surveys on your seats, and um, you also find, will find more of them in the back. There's some um, uh, pencils and so forth. And you can just fill those out and just leave them in that box on the back table in the silo. Um, in the meantime, here's my cell phone. Do like me turn it off or set it to stun rather than <laughs> kill. And uh, without further ado, I'd like to invite Dr. Roger Horowitz up here to invite tonight's speaker. Roger. Thanks, Eric. First, the magic podium. Well, I'm so excited. Uh, Roger Har I'm Roger Horowitz. I'm the uh, director of the Center for the History of Business Technology and Society. I'm so excited at this crowd. I mean, this is like the largest crowd we've had here since the pandemic started. I mean, this is just great, and I'm really thrilled, above all, that all of you have, have come out to join us for one of these author talks. Uh, it's great to see this kind of uh, interest. It's great to see all your willingness to come out here. And, uh, you know, as we would say, we're Jewish next year in Jerusalem. Next year, hopefully, no masks. Uh, let's all say, say for that there. Um, well, today we're here for another author talk uh, to hear Rachel Lance talk about her book, In the Waves, My Quest to Solve the Mystery of a Civil War Submarine. Uh, and if you like the way this book looks, we have them for sale in the back, just in case you're curious, and Rachel's going to be available to, to sign them, just so we have an ad from the sponsor. Now, this book came out... Uh, in uh, 2020. And some of you may remember what happened in 2020, the pandemic, remember that thing? Um, and it wasn't a great time to have a, a new book come out for this. And one thing it did is it made it hard for Rachel to do in-person author talks like this. So she tells me this is the first in-person yeah. book talk she's done there. So we're counting on you, audience. You know, um, you, you gotta make up for two years if we're waiting for this chance. So we're counting on you to be enthusiastic and ask really good questions uh, at, at the end there. Um, now, we do these author talks because Hagley has fabulous research collections, 
and it's one of my great privileges to, in working here that my job is to bring people through to use these collections and then to promote that we have these collections and that people who are using the collections, like Rachel, write really, really interesting stuff. That is my job in a nutshell. I joke that if we had better transportation in Delaware, I might not have a job. But you know, someone's got to tell people, hey, out here in the countryside, we have you know, eight miles of manuscript material, 300,000 books, somewhere in the neighborhood of three million pictures and all that. We got a lot of stuff. And we have people come from all over the world in this country to do research here. Um, so my job really is to, is to promote that, make people aware of that. And I do have a variety of things you know, in, that, in that area there. Uh, one thing I do that I want to bring your attention to is a series called Hagley History Hangouts. We have a uh, flyer in the back, uh, which are interviews online with people who've used our collections. And one of those interviews was with Rachel uh, a little while ago. But the author talks are special. The author talks, you have to write a book that we think is going to generate an audience like this. And so it has to be a book which speaks to a large audience. It has to be on an interesting topic. It has to be well written and all those kinds of things. It has to be a good book for that, from that sense. And we do have really solid books written from our collection that probably would get us 10 or 20 people in the audience. This is nothing against the authors, but in the academic world, sometimes things can be a little niche oriented. But we do have people like Rachel who speak to a broad audience, who have projects that can reach out to large numbers of people that are interesting, innovative, and that's why we bring people like Rachel here for, for our talks there. So these really are special. We will have more of these talks in the fall, uh, but this is the last one for the spring. Now, we met Rachel Lance because she applied for a research grant uh, in our research grant program to use our collections, and I had a chance to talk to her there, um, and we loved the concept. And we loved the research that she was doing and the effort to explicate this historical case using historical records, at really the juncture of science and history. Um, so that's really why we, we want to do this here, and it's why it's so interesting, uh, the book itself. Now, just to tell you about Rachel Lance herself, um, she is an author, of course, and, and her title is Assistant Consulting Professor in the Department of Anesthesiology at Duke University. That's even more longer than my title. Uh, although at least you know what you, what you kind of do there. Um, she specializes in injury biomechanics and is especially fascinated by the trauma patterns from blast and ballistic events. Um, she has a, um, her degrees are, uh, we're right, right here, right there. Uh, oh yeah, she has degrees in biomedical engineering uh, from the University of Michigan, BA and master's degree, and a PhD in biomedical engineering from Duke University. So we have here is a scientist who has crossed over into history which is fabulous, and we love it when people use our collections for that purpose. Her current research is focused on the development of methods for human survival in extreme environments, like underwater and in outer space. Um, and she's working on a project right now, which I love, on uh, World War II, and the develop, uh, if you will, of um, technology to breathe underwater, so we could figure out how to invade and defend the United States against very nasty dictators. A, project, which unfortunately isn't quite complete. That's all I'll say about that. So you'll hear more about her. Hopefully she'll come back and give a talk. But for now, let's welcome her and tell, ask her to tell us more about In the Waves. Come on, Rachel. I need that. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much to you both for the introduction and um, also for paying for me to come here for my original research without quite knowing how it would work out. So obviously that research has since been completed. It became the capstone to my doctoral dissertation at Duke. And it also eventually turned into this story that people kept asking me to talk about. Now, when you're a scientist, that's a very unusual situation because normally they get two words into my official mumbo jumbo title and then they start edging away from me at the cocktail party. So with the Hunley, that was the first time I really knew that I had Something special here that appealed to a broader number of people was actually not until after I had completed the project and everyone kept wanting to hear this story. Um, so I happened to be at a time in my life when the circumstances lined up. I'd always loved literature and I just decided to write it down and that became the book. 
So before I get started on this talk, I'm gonna give you a couple of short reading passages mixed with some visual aid slides to talk about the research that I did as well as the history of the submarine itself. Um, but I just wanted to also thank you guys for, for being willing to comply with the mass policy today. Um, that was at my request. I actually am pretty medically high risk myself. Um, and so this is my first author event, as Roger said, because I've not really been able to um, do a lot, of, a lot of things with public crowds. And so um, I, I really, really appreciate that. And thank you for doing that and making me feel so welcome here. This is extremely exciting for me. So, okay. Now we're gonna take us back and we're gonna go time travel back to the Civil War. It is 1861, April 12th. The South has just declared its independence from the United States of America. They initially thought that they would be let to leave the Union without any pushback or with any real resistance from the remaining states. They thought that they would simply secede and form their own nation. The response, as we now know, was quite the opposite of that, and it eventually turned into what still stands today as America's bloodiest war. This is an image of Fort Sumter, which is not only outside Charleston, South Carolina, the site of where the secession began, but it's also the site of the first shots fired in the Civil War itself. So you can kind of see here that this once great fort that had been built several decades earlier has been slowly whittled down by the material that I came here to talk to you guys about today and what I've sort of built this talk around. That is black powder. This is the oldest explosive material that we have in history. And at the time of the Civil War, it was still pretty much exclusively the type of munition and the type of ordnance that was used. So as they're trying, the Union ships who are stationed off the coast of Charleston, South Carolina, are doing their best to whittle away through bombardment of this landside city and doing their best to whittle away at the structure of Fort Sumter, the site of where the entire thing began. We have thousands and millions of pounds of this material black powder for which um, Hagley and the DuPont name originally became known during that time period. So that's what ties us all together with this site today. All right, one of the things that the Confederates did in order to attempt to alleviate themselves from this incredible onslaught of nonstop nightly munitions being dropped onto the city of Charleston was they began experimenting with unconventional warfare tactics. Now, as I mentioned, the South didn't necessarily anticipate a war. And so one of the commonly cited facts about the South and the Confederacy is that it had less industry than the North, it had less rail transport than the North, and it had less population of fighting age than the North. Those facts are also fairly well known, but one of the other things that's really interesting is that at the time of the Civil War, as can be found in Hagley's archival records, less than 1% of the production of black powder, this unbelievably crucial element, is actually taking place in the Confederate States at the time they secede. So what they have to do is they have to get creative. They start, and I'm, I'm gonna sound like I'm picking on the South here, I'm not, because full disclosure, the North was doing it too, but they start experimenting with what at the time were called infernal machines, and they mean this word infernal quite literally. They mean it literally has come straight from the bowels of hell itself, and it's considered an unethical approach to warfare. Real warfare, they uh, look you in the eye before they shoot you, a sort of mentality, whereas with these submarines, which they first start developing, or they didn't first start, but which they start developing in earnest within the, sub, within the Civil War, all of a sudden stealth becomes a factor. This is no longer considered a gentleman, gentlemanly sort of warfare. We're more reliant on these attacks. But still, even though we've moved underwater, even though we've moved into this world of stealth and ingenuity, as opposed to the more straightforward traditional warfare, the black powder is still gonna be a central role. All right, so here is a three-dimensional rendering of the submarine H.L. Hunley, as she would have looked at the time of her use in February 1864. So we're gonna get back to the attack in just a second, but I just wanna point out a couple of the key features for some of you who might be 
learning for the first time that submarines were part of the Civil War. So anyway, on the lower right, we have this massive black powder bomb. At the time, those were referred to as torpedoes. But this was really the key weapon in the Hunley's arsenal. And this submarine was the product of a people who were using, as I mentioned, their creative creativity, their ingenuity, their last resources. So this is a homemade submarine. It was hammered together out of the recycled iron plates of a steamship boiler, and they hammered it into this shape where they could somehow fit eight crew people inside. So there was one guy, and uh, you know, I worked for the Navy for the nine years as a civilian, so I like to joke that this guy was the officer so he didn't have to do any manual labor, and uh, any of the military people will, will understand that officer joke. But the other seven were seated, as you see them in this image in the upper right, they're seated along a crank handle. Now, they had experimented with other designs, they had experimented with diesel power, they had experimented with some degree with electricity, but what ended up happening was nothing else proved to be as robust and as reliable as simple, good old-fashioned muscle. And so, on the night of February 17, 1864, these eight members of the crew of the H.L. Hunley climbed into this submarine. Each of the seven took their places along the crank. Lieutenant George Dixon took his place under the forward conning tower, which is up, oh, which is up here. These were the ways that he would have looked out and noticed where he was going for navigation. And they began to proceed toward the convoy of ships that was blockading Charleston Harbor and peppering it every night with thousands and millions of pounds of black powder bombs. So I wanted to start out um, actually just reading a quick passage because this is, and the attack is the prologue of the book. So it's no surprise that the attack happens. The attack is what starts this entire story and it's what starts the entire story of me researching it. So, the dark hull of the submarine rose a few inches above the waterline, belying the impressive metal body submerged below. Pale moonlight glinted off the quiet ocean as small waves lapped rhythmically against the hull. The submarine was 40 feet long, cylindrical down most of her slim length, but with a tapered wedge-shaped bow and stern that hinted at how quickly she could slice through the water. Two narrow oval conning towers rose above the peak of the rounded hull, and a double row of small glass deadlights punctuated the surface between them. The deadlights, with their thick, imperfect handmade glass, provided the only means for the moonlight to pierce the submarine's bulk, and the only sign that there might be a crew within. Her bow carried the true source of her threat. A spar made of wooden metal was bolted securely to a pivot on the bottom corner of the boat's leading edge. And at the far end of the spar was a copper cylinder the size of a keg, the boat's torpedo. The torpedoes of the time were simple stationary bombs, very different from the modern independent devices that can propel themselves through the water from a great distance. To complete her mission, the Hunley would need to approach her target closely then use this spar to press the charge directly against the side of her enemy's hull. As the submarine bobbed slowly in the waves, the lethal orange cylinder bobbed with it. So we're going to fast forward a little bit just because there's, you know, um, this is a lengthy attack. But we're going to, the Hunley approached the hulking wooden mass of the Housatonic, and the comparatively tiny submarine began to pick up speed. A sailor on watch spotted the narrow sliver of the dark metal hull exposed above the surface of the water and alerted the other sailors on board, but submarines were new technology and the men did not yet understand the deadly shape in the water. For a few brief minutes, speculation ran wild among the crew, and the sailors did nothing as they comforted themselves that the dark shape was merely a porpoise coming to play near the ship. They realized the approaching danger too late, and the crew scrambled for firepower, any firepower, that could be trained to hit the oncoming object. The submarine remained undeterred. The H.L. Hunley pressed her torpedo snugly against the Housatonic side, one of the three thin metal rods protruding from the leading face of the bomb to press slightly against the wooden hull. The fragile wire holding the rod precariously in place snapped, freeing the coiled and waiting energy of the compressed spring that was firmly wrapped around its body. As the spring rapidly expanded to its natural shape, the metal rod leapt backward in response and smashed against the thin wall of the compartment that was nestled in the back of the trigger. 
Inside the compartment were two small caps filled with mercury fulminate. In the simple, elegant chemical was inherently unstable, dying for the slight nudge that would propel it into a cascade of cathartic release. Any fire is a release of energy. Chemicals and materials in one state leap to a more stable, lower energy state, like a rock rolling down to a lower energy state at the bottom of a hill. The energy released takes the form of heat, sound, and light. An explosion is that reaction pushed into higher speed. So this is, um, this is sort of an indirect method of talking about why I do what I do. And the reason that I wanted to include this passage today was because it really describes some of the background physics and the background chemistry that's so important to a blast researcher like me. So when we're looking at explosive materials, regardless of what time period they're used in, they all have the same key essential elements. They all have some sort of fuel, they all have some sort of oxygen, and they all have some sort of trigger. And the way that those things can get combined can either lead to good productive things, for example, like mining operations, which use explosives all the time, or they can lead to mayhem, chaos, and death. So on the evening of February 17, 1864, the Hunley pressed that torpedo up against the wooden hull of the 200-foot-long sloop USS Housatonic, and that was the reaction that initiated the burn through the black powder inside of the torpedo that would then cause the explosion that would send the Housatonic to the bottom of the ocean. The Housatonic itself was on the ocean floor within within five minutes. The ocean was only about 30 feet deep at that depth, so the mass and rigging still stuck, stuck up out of the water. And the crew, most of them at least, were able to save themselves by climbing up there and scrambling into the rigging so that they'd avoid hypothermia. Even though they're in South Carolina, it's still February, and the water temperatures are cold enough to kill them all within an hour. So this is a, this is a, uh, contemporary drawing of the blast. So obviously it was done after the attack occurred, but the blast size is actually fairly consistent with what this type of torpedo would have produced. Okay. So next, Hagley. Um, hopefully this image, I heard some murmurs, so I think this image is probably pretty familiar to many of the people in this room. But for those um, who might be watching or who haven't had the privilege of visiting here before, this is a black powder mill, and yes, I did steal this directly from the Hagley website um, <laughs> before coming here, because I want to point out a few things. This mill is used in the process of making black powder. As I mentioned, there are different components. There's a fuel, there's an oxidizer. In the case of black powder, there's also sulfur. These things need to be mixed and ground together. And what that essentially means is in the final stages of manufacture, you are taking an explosive and hitting it really hard. <laughs> That's not a great idea. So the Hagley Museum, to me, is one of these places that are these gemstones of history where you can come and get a feeling firsthand for the types of processes that we thankfully no longer have to do today for jobs. Making black powder is one of those things that I am so glad I do not have to do because you see the picture of the mill wheels here, and on the top you see this slanting roof. So as those of you who have taken this tour down by the waterfront, you know that these buildings were designed to explode. Not that they wanted them to explode on purpose, but they knew that it was not if, but when. So as they're creating this massively powerful explosion that just sank 200 foot long sloop of war in our last slide, they are doing it by hitting it with giant iron wheels. They are grinding it together to make it into a fine powder. And they know that at some point, something will set this off. So this is a shot that I did take myself when I was here um, doing this research. And again, it's for those who maybe haven't had the opportunity to walk down by the waterfront, but on the left-hand side of the frame is one of the milling buildings, and these are built out of strong stone, except for that flimsy roof and that flimsy fourth wall that are designed to direct the force of the blast. Then there is a space with another additional wall over on the right where some they had to run behind that wall for safety before they started the mill. 
So this is the context in which we're talking about the Hunley. This is the context in which these people are building these machines of war, in which they're using these tools of black powder. This gives you a sense of sort of the extremities to which they will go in order to achieve their mission. They come to a job every day where they know there's a very realistic risk of explosion, fire, death. And it also becomes the most key tool at least for the both sides of the warring factions. All right, so the Hunley was not seen again after her victory. She sank the USS Housatonic in their frenzy to scurry up the rigging and avoid the cold death in, in the frozen waters, nearly frozen waters. The crew of the Housatonic, only one of them reported seeing a final glimpse at the Hunley before she floated away. It was nearly 150 years before she was seen again and a team of explorers announced um, with the publicity help of Clive Kussler, who was funding the expedition, that they had found the location in 1995. So they brought her up. Thankfully, um, they did something extremely smart, which was not tell anybody the coordinates until the lawyers had all signed everything. Um, <laughs> So after all the paperwork was done and everyone agreed where the Hunley would go and how she would be conserved, they brought her up in the year 2000 and they took her to Charleston, South Carolina for conservation. Now, I don't typically go into that story as much because to me that's not my story. That's, that's not necessarily what I contributed to this boat. This boat has a huge and long, rich history, so we could be here for days talking about it and if if the Hagley team keeps providing refreshments, I'll do that. But um, <laughs> the reason that I got interested in this was because I was at Duke and I was working as a PhD student. So as Roger mentioned, I was working on underwater blast trauma. I'd already been working for the Navy building breathing systems for a while. So my background is in respiratory physiology and the physiology of breathing. And um, I saw this as an opportunity to kind of add a little bit of a capstone onto that project. So the majority of what I've been doing have been looking at um, unprotected swimmers who were in the water and who had gotten accidentally blasted. But my advisor one day just walked into my office and he sort of sat himself down, which if you know professors, they have a way of doing. And then he sort of started in the middle of a sentence, which again, if you know professors, they have a way of doing. And he asked me what I thought about the case of the Hunley. So I'd already been working on underwater explosions. I'd already been working on modeling modern day explosives and their effects on the people. And I had not the first clue what he was talking about. Um, but when you're a grad student, you just kind of agree with what they're saying until they leave, and then you Google it. So that was what I did, <laughs> and that was how the Hunley Project got started. Um, initially, I very naively thought it might take like a weekend or two, and it spiraled wildly out of control. <laughs> um, all right, so one of the things, as I'm sitting in my office, frenziedly Googling this thing I've never heard of before, that starts to come up are these pieces of evidence that the archaeologists and conservation experts down in South Carolina have managed to pull out of this submarine as they've been working painstakingly on its conservation for decades. One of the things that was interesting to me is the watch broke. This is the watch of Lieutenant George Dixon. Yes, of course, this is a modern photograph of his original watch. This watch did not wind down, it broke, and it broke at a time that was consistent with the time of the attack. Now, as a scientist, I cannot tell you for certain it broke during the attack because it might have broken exactly 12 hours later or 24 hours later. I have no proof of that, but that is definitely what we would call suggestive correlation. Another thing that was interesting to me is if you look at the position of the bones inside the submarine, nobody is trying to escape. This is the arms and legs of Lieutenant George Dixon. Now, unfortunately, some decay had happened before the rest of his skeleton was locked in place as tidily. Um, his head tumbled into the bilge. But um, you can see here, <laughs> sorry, things happen after 150 years underwater. So you can see here that he was actually still seated on his little pilot's bench when he died. So this little piece of wood back here is his own private bench, 
and he has his hips and legs positioned back there, and he's simply slumped over. Now, the key part of this image, and the part that really brings it home for me, is the exit from this submarine is here. So if this guy wanted to get out, literally all he had to do was stand up. And he didn't. He fell over. Now, as a blast trauma specialist, one of the things that I spend a lot of time doing is ruining movies for people. <laughs> um, don't watch movies with me. Uh, I am that person who points out everything wrong. But um, the biggest thing that the movies have misled us about is the ability of an explosion to throw a human body. Explosions can be large enough to throw a human body. That is absolutely physically possible. However, if they reach that magnitude, the person is dead 100% of the time. That is a fatal exposure level. So when you see people who happen to have been slumped over on their tiny pilot's bench where they are an officer so they don't have to crank, that is a sign of a potential blast trauma. So that was what was really interesting to me, piqued my interest. These people have this massive black powder bomb. It's released all kinds of fire and fury into the water. And all of a sudden, all eight of the crew has simply slumped over. However, they're inside their submarine. Nothing like this has ever really happened before. Now, in the field, we know that blast can go through materials. It's a bit like sound. If you're in a cheap hotel room, you're going to hear your neighbors. But if you have good walls, then you're protected. Blast has some of the same properties. It can go around corners. But there's never, at least until we were looking at these pictures, a confirmed case of blast trauma occurring within this kind of enclosed vessel. Now, at the time, I just, again, thought it would be a weekend project. So I sort of just let it go. Um, but then the more I looked at it and the more it just bothered the back of my brain, the more I looked up other information. So here is an image of the end of the spar. When the submarine was recovered, the spar was recovered with it. And as they start to chip away at the years and decades of crud that are encasing the end of this long pole, the conservationists discover that this is the copper from the torpedo. The torpedo was still attached. So what this tells me as a scientist is I now know the exact distance they were from the bomb. This is incredibly key because blast can decay very quickly with distance. So for example, if you are near an explosion in air, the matter of a few inches can mean the difference between life and death. Underwater, it's far less sensitive. Um, just like whale sounds travel for a very long distance, explosions can travel much farther underwater as well. But at the same time, as an engineer, looking at this problem as a scientist, now I have the exact distance. That's a very tempting clue. The other tempting clue is this torpedo drawing, which was um, uncovered by another researcher, not myself, I can't take credit, in the US National Archives. And this is what we call a bomb diagram. So now I know how far away the bomb was, I know what the submarine was like, and I know how they built their munition. Um, now, I do not generally, even in a safe legal context, I do not generally take charge of building the bombs. I leave that to people who are far more specialized in that um, than I am, and I watch and wait excitedly for the moment when you get to hit the button. But um, basically, when you have a charge like this, really the construction and the manner in which it's built is a really big part of determining how it will go off and what will happen as a result. So I wanted to talk about um, what happens next, which is essentially what brought me to the place where we're standing right now. We have these clues, we have the distance, we have the charge models or draw schematic, and what I need now is to know more information about what goes inside. Essentially, how were they making black powder during the years of the Confederacy? The drive from North Carolina to Delaware had been long, and the sun had already gone down on the closed museum property. Mine was the only car in the small parking lot at the remote back entrance, and a thick downpour gushed over my windshield. 
Crouching under my little red umbrella, I ran toward the hewn stone edifice of the darkened building I guessed was the former blacksmith shop where I was supposed to stay for the week. After punching the code on the locked door of the unoccupied shop, I was relieved when it creaked open to allow me in out of the deluge. The Hagley Museum is not a normal museum. It is a former black powder mill built by French immigrant. There is a 100% chance I'm saying this name wrong, and I apologize. <laughs> Should have asked someone before the talk, but Eleuther et René Dupont in 1802. The famously wealthy DuPont name is now firmly associated with a diverse portfolio of chemistry and innovation. But E.I. DuPont first established the base of the family fortune by grinding black powder at this mill. As all the other American powder manufacturers shut down, one factory at a time, each sent their black powder documents for preservation to the DuPont-funded library and archives at Hagley. The working steel rollers of the museum's mills still turn inside their massive stone hutches, powered by the endlessly churning waters of the Brandywine River, but now they grind away at nothing and serve only to delight visitors. They have everything ever written about black powder, the woman in charge of research at GOEX had told me when I called her begging for data. Um, GOEX is the American black powder manufacturer, and I, I heard recently that they may have gone out of business, but at that time they were the only black powder manufacturer, um, so I just kept calling them until they told me to come here. Everything. <laughs> and after a $400 travel grant provided by the good folks at Hagley, I had finally arrived to bury myself in their historical treasure. The archives at Hagley are stashed in a building called the Soda House. Tucked away on the back of the mill property, the gorgeous stone soda house and its arched high ceilings used to guard staggering white mountains of sodium nitrate. Also called nitrate of soda, hence the building's name, sodium nitrate is an oxidizer that replaces potassium nitrate in the specialized black powder destined to blast open mines. These days, the statuesque building serves as a wedding venue and the high arches are home to black powder documents instead of ingredients. They contain shelf upon shelf filled with the same gray filing boxes found in every archive in the world, all tended by an ingenious man named Lucas Clausen. Hopefully some, that means some of you know Lucy Lucas, but I couldn't resist putting him in here. Um, Lucas knows the archives of Hagley. He knows them as if he had been born in the aisles between the stacks. I sat at one of the long tables in the massive, vaulted, white-walled reading room with my camera, tabletop tripod, and document stand ready for action. I was instinctively quiet, even though I was the only one there. Lucas would silently appear carrying filing box after filing box, placing them on the table for me to photograph before he once again disappeared without a word back out the door to the stacks. Between his meticulously groomed handlebar mustache and his deliberately antique fashion style, I felt as if I were being handed the secrets of the Hunley's torpedo by my own personal Civil War ghost librarian. It was through Lucas Clausen that I first met George Washington Raines, military chemist and Confederate black powder demigod. All right, so that pretty much says it about my experience at Hagley. It was really important for me to write that in here because I think a lot of times um, there's a disconnection between science and history in practice when in reality science and history closely drive each other. There are so many examples of key historical events being the impetus to move science forward. The zipper was an invention from World War I, as was stainless steel. Um, you know, the mass production of penicillin came out of the need to supply troops during World War II. Uh, these, these examples are innumerable, and um, the fact that people try to disconnect them, I think, is a little bit sad because you can't truly understand what's happening with the background science until you understand where it came from. And for me, the Hagley archives had the secrets to where this came from. As I was trying to replicate this blast and as I was trying to replicate this bomb that had been built by the Hunley, by the, uh, built for use by the crew of the Hunley, I wanted to make sure that I was understanding the ingredients and the process and the chemistry of the black powder that was going in it so that I would make sure that I was creating the correct scenario. Like you, you, there are ways to do this wrong. Um, so what I mentioned at the end of that 
It was something called the Bomb Brothers. And Hagley was not only a treasure trove of data, but it was also the first place I started learning about these two characters um, who are still, who I think two of the most fascinating people in the entire Civil War. So while the North was getting approximately half of its black powder supplied directly by the DuPont Company during the time, the Confederacy, as I mentioned, had less than 1% of the black powder manufacturing at the time they seceded. They were desperate. And then, of course, with the blockades, their allies abroad couldn't even really be sending them. So they, I mean, what were they going to do? Start throwing bullets at people? So they had to figure it out really quickly. The two people who were really influential in making that happen were these two gentlemen who had the, earned the nickname the Bomb Brothers, even at the time, Gabriel and George Washington Rains. George Washington Rains was a chemist, and he somewhere found a pamphlet from somewhere in Europe where they had made black powder. This pamphlet did not have any pictures or diagrams, and so George Washington Rains was like, yes, I can do this, and that was how he built the Confederacy's largest black powder mill. Now, he thankfully left behind sufficient records to indicate that what he was doing was enough of a mimic of what was happening in the North that the Hagley data was still considered comparable and useful to me. The chemistry from what George Washington Reigns was doing for supplying these bombs, for supplying and filling the bomb of the Hunley, was still going to be informed by the secrets locked in these archives. His brother Gabriel Reigns is perhaps best known or most infamous for inventing the landmine, um, which he was quite pleased about. He was using to blow up Native American warriors. But during the Civil War, he was also the first person to take that and say, hey, let's make it underwater. So this is from a handwritten textbook that Gabriel Rains left behind. It is in another archive, although thankfully some other history aficionado has gone through and copied and transcribed it, and I was able to simply order the transcription. But Gabriel Rains starts playing with these different torpedo designs, and he's doing this quite scientifically. He thinks that the ironclads are a distraction. Everyone's focused on these ironclads, the Monitor and the Merrimack during the Civil War. Everyone's obsessed with the idea that these big metal ships are going to rule the world. But Gabriel Rains proved to have actual foresight. He said the ironclads are said to master the world, but the torpedoes master the ironclads. And by torpedoes, what he really meant was black powder and this use of underwater explosions. So Gabriel Rains, using the munitions provided to him by his brother, George Washington, he started conducting the scientific testing. So this is a contemporary photograph of using the different types of black powders and different charge sizes to see what kind of force they could get out of this stuff. What kind of force could it be used to project cannonballs and different munitions? Now, allegedly against the ironclads as in this photo, but at the same time to try and optimize their production. So most of the Confederate records were destroyed at the end of the war. There are not a lot that survive in terms of their actual experimentation, but because we have enough to know that their uh, processes were very similar to what was happening up here, we can look at the Hagley archives, where thankfully, Lucas Clausen brought me this guy. So this is not the only thing I found there. Obviously, it was a week of discovery. But this is just one of the examples of, of my favorite part of archival research. Um, it's like the quietest celebration of your life. Like you're in there and it's a literal library and you cannot exclaim and you cannot jump and scream, but that's what you wanna do because every, you just turn a page and 99 times out of 100, it's potentially interesting but not very useful. And then every once in a while you turn that page and you, you find a jewel. So what I learned up here was that they had this charge weight and originally at the time, um, myself and everyone else thought the charge weight of the Hunley was 135 pounds of powder. Now, since then, th I've uncovered some more historical documents that make me think that there's more evidence to say it was 200 pounds. But at the time of these experiments, 135 pounds was the number. And at Hagley, the DuPont family has tested exactly that value. So now we know this thing 
is producing 24,200 pounds per square inch of powder into the side of the Housatonic. So this bomb, this 135 pounds, this beer keg of a bomb is producing 24,200 PSI. That's an incredible value. So that was enough to combine with a bunch of the other scientific experimental data in order to come up with an assessment of the effects of the bomb and correct for the difference between the history and the modern day stuff. Okay, so we take us back to the Hunley, and just to, I just wanted to revisit this image one more time. So now you imagine we have a 16-foot spar, and on the end of it is 24,000 pounds of pressure per square inch. Gabriel Rains was aware of these torpedo boats, as they called them. He was aware of their plans to use spars to press his inventions of these underwater bombs against the sides of enemy ships. And he referred to the idea as an abortion of invented genius. He said that at minimum, that at minimum to make these things safe, you needed a spar that was 40 to 50 feet long. So here, as an explosives expert, if your explosives expert tells you you need to be at least 40 feet away from something, you should be at least 40 feet away from something. The crew of the Hunley was 16 feet away, and that was the final real clue for me to combine with the rest of this information and look at this from a scientific perspective, reconstruct this blast, put instrumentation on the inside of the submarine and inside the water, and evaluate whether or not my theory of the mysterious crew deaths being from the blast, despite being on the inside of their submarine, was plausible or not. All right, so I like to include a couple of photos from the testing just because everyone has kind of, not everyone, that's not fair, but for some people, the only time they see science is really in the movie and on TVs, and they have a huge budget for those things. Real science is way grubbier. So <laughs> I just like to take myself down a peg here. Um, I'm not in a sleek stainless steel and glass building. Um, I am stealing my boyfriend at the time's shorts because the fish are biting me. Um, I am in my apartment complex swimming pool in the middle of winter. In North Carolina, they don't have to drain the pools. Um, the staff was watching me from the window going, what the hell is this girl doing? But, um, you know, real science is a little bit more shoestring. You pour everything you have into the project. And so with the help of the correct federal authorities, I was able to set off black powder munitions, knowing because of the archival data that what I was doing was actually on the weaker side of what would have been managed by Gabriel Rains and George Washington Rains during the Civil War. Um, so my charges were at, at the request of the ATF. We undersized our charges. Um, <laughs> So uh, this is a video because everybody loves the video of the explosions. So hopefully. Go ahead. Three, two, one. Oh, that was beautiful. So you can see the smoke drifting away, um, black powder often produces tons of smoke and that's kind of a characteristic signature of it. One of the things that I think is really fascinating about underwater explosions is when you're standing there on this pier, this is, this is actually the pond of a kindly local farmer who asked remarkably few questions before giving me permission to set off explosives on his land. But um, it's a very nice guy. We still exchange Christmas cards. But um, he's like, all right. But um, anyway, you, you can really notice the difference in the transmission speeds. So I'm going to get pretty nerdy here. But light travels the fastest of everything, right? So you see this explosion occur. And then even though I wasn't terribly far away, it transmits through the water next most quickly. And so you feel it just rumble up through your feet. Even if you're on the pier or you're on the ground, you feel it next. And then there's a noticeable delay before you hear it last of all because that sound is transmitting the slowest through the air. And so it creates this weird sequence of events um, where it feels feels like this extended experience, but the same thing would have been true for the crew of the Housatonic. Most of them actually reported that they didn't hear very much, 
There were a crew in the belly of the Housatonic who, when that explosion went off, reported that the only way they knew their ship would soon be on the ocean floor was because they saw water start to infiltrate around their ankles and feet. And so that's how they knew they had to get up to the deck of the ship. They could feel it shudder and they could feel it start to list, but the blast itself was surprisingly quiet. So after that quiet blast in February 17th, 1864, that's when the crew of the Henley drifted off to her final resting place. All right, so I'm, I'm about to wrap up, but there is one question that I get over and over and over again. And that is why do I think the crew of the Hunley was willing to do this? So before their final mission, February 1864, um, there were two previous sinkings. So already 13 people had died inside this submarine. They had drowned, including Horace Hunley himself, which is how the boat got that name. It was originally named the fish boat until he died trying to claw his way out through the forward conning tower from the bottom of the ocean. But even knowing that, a third crew volunteered, even though their explosives expert said longer spar. So the most question, or the most common question I get is why do I think people did this? Um, I spent a lot of time thinking about this, but the reality is I've never been a soldier in combat. So I've read all of these accounts. I've read of the nightly bombardment of Charleston. I've read of how frequently they were being blasted. The pilot of the Henley, Lord, or Lieutenant George Dixon himself, left behind letters saying he was basically getting harassed constantly to do something about all this bombing, and he couldn't take it anymore. So I wanted to provide a quote um, from another author who has been there himself, this is a quote from a book by a man named Casey Tellison, um, who I reached out to, and he has thankfully given me permission, but he wrote this unbelievably beautiful book. Um, I, I don't personally know him or anything, but he wrote this unbelievably beautiful book about his time over in Iraq and Afghanistan. So this is a modern memoir. And so the section in bold here, um, I think sort of emphasizes how you become immune to this risk when you're exposed to it constantly. And I think he does a better job of speaking for why the crew got in the boat than I ever could. So he said, I believed that a person only has so many rolls of the dice when it comes to risking their life. I never imagined I would survive my first deployment. I was certain I was going to die, which was freeing in a way. I ran through the gunfire because I didn't think it mattered. If, it was, if I was going to die anyway, why care if it was from a bullet or a bomb? Um, so that sentence really hit me, the why I care if it was from a bullet or a bomb piece, because I think that's really something that is consistently seen through records of soldiers in warfare, is when they are immersed in that scenario and they sort of just go into um, almost this mechanical response where they resign themselves to the fate regardless. Um, all right. So the last thing that I wanted to close with is just a very brief passage that is really important to me. Um, this passage I put into the book as the explanation of why I do what I do. Um, and so, okay. Each major war comes with advances in military technology and fresh young soldiers almost always become the first victims. During the Civil War, the Reigns brothers brought mayhem with their inventions of landmines and underwater torpedoes. By World War I, machine guns and high explosives were deployed to the trenches, rendering cavalry charges obsolete and introducing the first widespread patterns of blast trauma. World War II brought submarine wolf packs roaming the seas and atomic bombs, and along with them came innumerable medically novel in water and nuclear blast victims. In Iraq and Afghanistan, the rise in popularity of IEDs caused so many blast-induced traumatic brain injuries that these injuries became known as the, quote, signature wound of the conflicts. During peace, militaries seek to prepare for the next war by developing innovative, more effective ways to kill. Then, when the war starts, soldiers are shipped home with different injury types than in the previous wars. Medical scientists and researchers who take a long time to produce answers because of the tedious, exacting nature of scientific research, struggle to keep up with the technological advances in weaponry. Blast casualties are uncommon in the civilian world, especially when compared to other traumatic events like car crashes. So the way the field moves forward is usually because a war starts. Soldiers come home wounded or dead. 
the country wants to know why and decides it is finally willing to fund the science. To explain it, and to please, oh please, hopefully stop it, people like me head to the lab to once again take up our Sisyphean race against the development of new weapons. When the conflicts are over and the dead seem to rest in peace, we are the ones who can be found sifting through the wreckage, still trying to figure out what really happened. Um, so yeah, that's obviously really important to me because that explains why I don't want to say I fell in love with blast trauma. I think that has the wrong kind of connotation, but why blast trauma is so personal to me, um, especially with the number of friends and coworkers who have come back from modern day conflicts with questions about their own injuries. And so this was a, a picture that I took at the Imperial War Museum in World War I, and I like to close with this a lot because I think it sort of sums that up. This is a sign from the trenches of World War I in Europe. And obviously it just says, do not stand about here. Even if you are not hit, someone else will be. So I think it, it really emphasizes how these, uh, these incidents and these traumas are the worst case scenario. And they're also usually accidental. And they're also usually in these situations of war. And so regardless of what got people there, regardless of why they're in the boat, or regardless of what side they were fighting on, or what politicians started what war for what reason, the physiology of blast trauma is the same for every human being across the planet. And so when we study these traumas, when we study these injuries, and we try to piece together the scenarios that can cause us this type of harm, um, that informs what we need to do to prevent it for everyone moving forward. And so um, if anybody wants to talk to me about bombs, I will happily do it for hours. Um, or the Civil War, also for hours. But um, I put my website down there. There is a contact me uh, form on it. It does go straight to me. I answer it. I'm not, um, not that fancy to have someone answering stuff for me. So that is the easiest way to get a hold of me. All right, and so now I think we will go ahead and open for questions. <laughs> Um, do you think every, the whole crew was killed all at once with the blast? Okay, that's a tricky question because in blast trauma and just like everything else, what we talk about is your percent chance of injury. So there's a lot of variability person to person. Um, it, to use car crashes as an example, if you put 100 people in a car and you crash it in the same scenario at 50 miles an hour, some fraction of them will be injured, some fraction will be killed, and some will be fine. And so typically what we talk about is the percent chance of trauma. Um, so when I, I actually have the numbers written down somewhere, but they're, they're in the notes in one of these. Um, so I calculated a percent chance of immediate fatality to the crew. And it was over 50%. So it's not 100%, but the chance of immediate severe pulmonary trauma, so severe trauma to the lungs, was 99% for each crew member. What that means is that hypothetically, yeah, maybe one or two of them survived the initial explosion, but realistically, if you're in a homemade metal tube in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean you, that needs you to crank it to get home, then that's probably going to ultimately lead to your, your death anyway. So the hull wasn't broken? The hull was not broken. Yeah, correct. Oh, and additionally, um, the archaeologists and conservation experts determined that there was still air inside the hull when it did sink. So when it sank to the bottom of the ocean, there was still an air bubble because it had stalactite formation. And that can only happen in air. It can't happen in water. So. Hi. Um I was wondering if you could take a second to just give us the idea of the trail of research that this all took. I'm sure coming here was the mother load, but yeah. there, there must be just a, a plethora of things that you're not talking about that really <laughs> came, came to all these conclusions. 
Yeah, this, I mean, obviously there's a time limitation and, and I don't want to bore everyone to tears with the full details of all of it. But yeah, no, no, um, that's, I think calling it a trail is maybe a little bit ambitious, more of like a distracted rabbit chasing shiny things um, would perhaps be a better description. But um, essentially what happened was thankfully everything I needed was in this general area because obviously this is where the bulk of the fighting was occurring and the bulk of the records therefore are stored. So from North Carolina, I can make four hour drive to um, the National Archives in Washington, DC, or it's about six hours to here, it's not terribly bad. And so this was several archives trips to Washington, DC um, in the National Archives there, as well as archives trips here, and then as well as um, working with the librarians extensively at Duke. We have spectacular librarians there who were willing to kind of uh, bloodhound sources for me um, and get them sent by interlibrary loan. So that was really the documents part and the documents part of the collecting what people were doing historically at that time. And I used that to then inform what I was doing with my modern day experiments. So there was a combination of the documents element and trying to figure out and make sure what I was doing was accurate to history. But then there was also the modern day blast physics element. So I was working with computational modeling programs to make sure I was building things correctly um, and to try and predict what I would get. The, the submarine that I showed you is a perfect one-sixth scale model. And so even like the thickness is correct, the ballast tanks in the submarine, in the scale model work, things like that. So you can scale a blast problem um, if you do the physics correctly. So there was a lot of physics and calculus involved in this project. Um, the, the academic papers, this it turned into three academic papers as well. Um, and so those are pretty easy to find, but I'm also happy to send them to people if they really want to look at like the level to which there was a marriage of archival work combined together with modern A blast physics. Um, okay. Uh, thank you very much for a, uh, for a very fascinating talk and uh, also some remarks on how to very efficiently use historical archives. Yeah. Um, I was wondering, so your research is basically a quest for answers across multiple disciplines and that makes the whole thing very complex. And I was wondering if you at any point uh, run into dead ends, into, into obstacles that, that you didn't really expect to find and how did you circumvent them? Oh gosh. Um... Yes, absolutely there are dead ends in research. Um, I don't know how to say this without self-incriminating. I tend to just kind of steamroller. <laughs> so um, I, I, I found that if you're very polite and you're very nice and you generally respect other people's expertise, which I do, like that's, it's in no way a ruse, but a lot of people are very willing to help you if you come to them from a place of wanting to learn more from their their life and their experience. And so that is a huge lesson for me, not just from this project, but in general. And so most of the dead ends that I encountered, um, I would say that I overcame, I didn't even necessarily overcome them. I just had a very generous team of people that we had kind of congealed together by the end of this project. And for whatever reason, they were willing to help me with this stuff. So I would say really the key to the dead ends was reaching out to experts and just politely asking them to loan their expertise and to talk through those dead ends with me and then find a way to barge through them. So, yeah. Uh, yes, I, I have a question on uh Hussitanic and uh, the Hunley. Yes. Now, you said, you know, about the, tr the explosion and everything is, well, you know where the Hunley went down. Where'd the other ship go down and what was the distance between them? Okay, so that was actually why it took so long to find the Hunley. The distance between them was 310 meters. And there, the part that was interesting about it is the Hussitanic, because it went down in such shallow water and it was such a massive ship, it was actually a shipping hazard. So the site of that wreck has been known since the minute it went down. It was never a challenge to find because it was literally sticking up out of the ocean. So actually over the years, they kept having to cut it down and cut it down because it was sort of in the middle of a shipping lane. But the reason it took so long to find the Hunley was because the Hunley drifted further out to sea. 
Everybody, there were actually bounties on it. Um, people were looking for this. People did not just forget about it. It was the subject of many search efforts, but all of them concentrated between this known position of the Housatonic and the land, because they figured, well, the Hunley's done. They're going to go back home. Why would they go out to sea? So anyway, that's why it took so long to find, was because its position was actually consistent with where it would have been if it had simply drifted away on the tide. Or they were going in the wrong direction. <laughs> well, and backwards. <laughs> so <laughs> they, were, they were pointing to land, but they had drifted out. So, yeah. What uh, kind of analogy can you make uh, between, and maybe this came up in your research, between the, uh, the Hunley's uh, detonation and what we would now call a depth charge attack on a submarine? So the major difference there is in the type of explosive used. Black powder doesn't detonate. Um, it can be coaxed to detonate it deflagrates. And there's a, it's a very fine difference that makes a very big difference in your physics. So when you have black powder and you have a deflagration, what that means is that it's burning slower than the speed of sound. And that really changes what kind of pressures it's creating out in the water. Now with a depth charge attack, for example, World War II, they were using primarily 300 pound TNT depth charges during that one. And so TNT has a proper detonation reaction. So that thing burns up faster than the speed of sound. And the reason that's important is it means that whole material is completely gone before it really starts to propagate outward as a pressure wave. And so the depth charge attacks are a lot more powerful um, and it's a different blast type. So you see different blast waveforms from them. Now, what I think you might be asking is like, why would the Hunley crew be susceptible, whereas a later crew might not? And that is actually a huge question. Um, I looked into it and I applied my physics curves that I had figured out from the Hunley. And if you look at the whole thickness for the next generation of submarines, so by the time they're building submarines in the 1900s, they want them to go deeper. So it's just like your hotel metaphor. They've accidentally blast proof these things because they've, I mean, the, the, the hull thickness of the Hunley was only three eighths of an inch. It was in the world of maritime construction, paper thin. And so by the time they were creating submarines that were designed for true depth, they're putting secondary hulls on them. They've accidentally made these things far more robust. Um, so if you look at the transmission patterns with the Hunley and then you apply it to those different hull thicknesses, even with a 300 pound TNT depth charge, for example, from World War II, you get a sound level that's about consistent, as long as it's at the limit where it will not sink the submarine. As long as you're, you know, you have a range where it'll sink the submarine and then as long as it's outside that limit, your maximum exposure is a sound level about the sound of a gunshot. And that's actually consistent with what the submariners in World War II report hearing. So it kind of nicely lines up. Thank you for a wonderful talk. Um, my question has to do kind of by extension of other applications that are also relevant to um, Hagley. Is it, are there applications of your work to other areas besides the military, such as um, injuries due to mining explosions? Um, yes, so a lot of the times with trauma, it feels a little bit like you're um, constantly behind. Like people get injured and killed at a rate that, as I sort of alluded to, we can't scientifically keep up with that. We have to sort of pick and choose what we can do. And a lot of that as well um, falls under the unfortunate but very practical reality that I do to some degree have to study what will fund me. Um, I don't have a trust fund. 
unfortunately. <laughs> so um, I do need to make sure that I, I'm paying my salary as well as the salary of the people who work with me through these projects. And so the military is a really big funding agency. And so that's why they're usually the target application. Um, and they also have the most blast exposure. However, you are correct, the physiology does apply. So a lot of us in the field, what we try to do is try to make it as broadly applicable as possible in the way that we set up our experiments. Um, especially in terms of like civilian defense, things like that, um, IEDs, terrorist bombings. We want to make sure that what we're doing is applicable to protection in those areas too. Because if someone is trying to build a bomb, if they're trying to hurt someone, they don't go looking up the blast physics research first. They just use as much as they can. So everything that the actual researchers do is used by the people who are trying to figure out the safety. Like how far away do you need to be from this monstrosity? that kind of stuff. So um, it's overall a pretty good community who does try to do that as much as possible. Well, great. Well, thank you for those questions. Let's thank Rachel again. <laughs> we have copies of the book if you want to buy them and ask Rachel to, uh, to sign them. Uh, otherwise, stay tuned. Let's hope the pandemic goes away. And next time I see you in the fall, these masks are history. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you all again so much. This has been really fun. Like I said, I haven't been able to do any in-person stuff, so it's been kind of a treat. Great. So. Fantastic. Thanks. Great talk. Oh, good. I'm great so glad. Talk. It's a great way to present. I mean, I'll say this. Sometimes the people who read the book, it 